Okay, well, welcome everybody for joining our continuing webinar. Um, tonight, <coughs> our speaker is Dan Leventhal. Um, he started his company back in 2006 and was probably one of the first people to do um, no gas equipment. Um, he's also been involved in organic land care. I personally have not met Dan before. I'm not sure why or how that happened, but um, he, he asked to be a speaker and I, I liked uh, some things that other people said and uh, what he's been doing over the years. So Dan, go for it, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Barry. And uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, if you're if you're in lawn care, I uh, I like Bill Clinton can feel your pain. It's a hard business, and uh, I think anybody who's doing it has uh, a lot to be proud of and respected for. And uh, <clears throat> but you know, I have a new saying to bring perspective, and that is. No matter what the pain, it still ain't Ukraine. So uh, we're pretty lucky. So, Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> tonight's uh, topic, it's, it's a nice segue from the last webinar. And hats off to you, Barry, for having a regular program of webinars. I enjoyed a couple of them. Uh, and uh, sorry, I missed one or two of them. But it, it's, it's really great. And so the segue from IPM is a good one into uh, a kind of a, a sustainability, you know, a pollinator pathway friendly kind of plant health segment. So uh, I'm gonna talk about our business, how we've evolved a little bit into uh, focusing on plant health, in addition to avoiding tons of pollution and noise and toxins, you know, by being zero emission and organic uh, and, and being into plant health and focusing on natives and uh, eliminating invasives. So I, I have been through the uh, AOLCP training with NOFA and I managed to pass the uh, rigorous Connecticut uh, pesticide supervisory uh, license exam uh, and uh, oral exam and I have an MBA also. And which is, I've done a lot of different work in my life. And, and uh, one of the hardest is this business. That's why I respect anyone who's doing this work. This picture is kind of cool. It's uh, the, in Bridgeport, it's the Green Village Initiative. It's beautiful. There's uh, community gardens. I love the sunflowers in the back. And uh, the only thing missing here is our five foot mower. But uh, what's going on out there is there's a kind of an awakening <clears throat> My dog is playing in the background. I hope that's not too distracting. She wants to play tug of war. I'm distracted. But anyway, uh, there's an awakening going on and people want to hire sustainability minded people. And the, the more sustainability minded uh, the uh, public uh, consuming public gets, the more they respect our efforts to be sustainable and, and organic zero emission and uh, native promoting. So this was an article in Irrigation and Green Industry News on uh, our electric practice, <clears throat> a nice cover photo. So uh, trying to break things down uh, simply, three, three pieces. Uh, it's good to avoid pesticides for plant health, uh, chemicals, excessive use, uh, misuse, and uh, focus on the ecosystem. That's everything above the ground, everything below the ground. <laughs> wow. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Zoom life. <laughs> Dan, I, I have, we have three dogs, so that's why I keep them out of the room when we're on air. <laughs> Jeez, it, it, are you hearing that noise too? Is that yeah. too distracting? Because I, I, uh, I will have to uh, close him up if it gets any worse, which is quieted down at the moment. But so we, we want to look at, you know, the, the uh, microclimates and, and the soil, soil testing. And then uh, natives make uh, things a lot easier. And there's a, <clears throat> there's a lot of momentum uh, in the customer base and in the sustainability uh, committees in towns 
to uh, focus on natives. There's a whole uh, movement going on, the half earth wild movement, uh, AKA pollinator pathway. And so there's all these groups. Uh, the, the reason these logos are here is just to point out that there's all these groups emerging, healthy yards, pollinator pathways, land trusts that are encouraging us, uh, we the people in land care to help fix the problem with losing the uh, birds and, and bugs uh, it, 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 uh, to maybe 30 or 40% uh, loss and try to avoid that through uh, improving land care methods. And one of those things being uh, focusing on healthy plants, uh, hopefully native plants, at least 70% native plants uh, is uh, what the word is out there. So for plant health, I like this. This is a, a customer. I think it's an example of uh, really good choices and a, and a really good uh, situation where we've got a lawn where they really, if it's green, it's good to them. Uh, it's, everything here is according to good tenants. The beds have living mulch. Uh, they don't have wood chips. Uh, the beds are big. So there's more soak up and, and carbon sequestering going on uh, as compared to, to the lawn. And there's a lot of native plants here. And in the background, that's all meadow and uh, fruit trees. It used to be lawn and they converted it to meadows. So I just think it's a, it's an inspirational shot. Dan, could you describe what you mean by living mulch? Sure, uh, living mulch is uh, ground cover to retain moisture and uh, protect bare soil. Instead of putting down, um, you know, leaves or uh, wood chips. So living living mulch is is great if you can get uh, if you can get ground cover established, native ground cover ideally. Uh, that's a, a little better option than than mulch. Of course, a little mulch doesn't hurt either, but you don't want to smother your ground cover. Thank you. My pleasure. So in terms of avoiding pesticides, we, we all know that it's bad for us, you know, with the endocrine disruption, carcinogenic nature and nerve damage that's uh, caused by a lot of the pesticides, uh, but they're also bad uh, for the plants. And, uh, and so, and they're often misused. Somebody said IPM isn't working. They, you know, they sit us, they give the Cornell gives us training manuals and they talk about how we should really evaluate leaching and, and uh, how, uh, and runoff and I'll take all these precautions and, and only, uh, only use uh, pesticides when you cross a certain economic threshold. But uh, the reality of the situation is a lot of practitioners uh, don't really adhere to uh, the principles of IPM. And as I think Chip Osborne mentioned, and he said, this IPM is not working. <laughs> so uh, it's just, it's helpful to, uh, to have a spirit of reform <clears throat> going forward and try to use uh, less synthetics and, and chemicals. They, they damage the soil and dead soil is bad for plants. So a good plant health means uh, living soil. Too many synthetics and chemicals kill uh, the uh, abundant life that should be in uh, normal uh, normal biology and soil. And again, a lot of, the, a lot of what I uh, may talk about here, I'm preaching to the choir. So I'll try to move quickly through it and then uh, we'll come back for Q&A. Now, plant health is not my strong suit. I'm, I'm known as the crazy uh, testifier at all the gas leaf blower ordinance meetings. I, I've been in probably 20 town meetings as a working model to inspire the elimination of gas leaf blowers, the most polluting tool. But I, I, uh, I'm so happy to have a chance to, uh, to talk about plant health and the things that we've learned and how our practice has moved towards it. And uh, I also look forward to uh, learning from uh, participants. Uh, we always learn from our customers and participants. So. Uh, there's just a note there that I am, I'm not an expert, but I'm learning, uh, learning a lot and learning more every day. So the practice, MoGreen, is all organic, uh, with, with one exception, about the same exception I think Chip Osborne makes under heavy weed pressure or uh, emergency conditions. 
hey, stop that. Give me that. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> you want to say hi, Camper? Come on, say hi to everybody. This is Camper. Whoa. Oh, can't get the screen on him. <laughs> say hi, buddy. He's got his own Instagram. He's my daughter's dog. She's a YouTuber. So he's famous. There you go, bud. And I have him for the week. <laughs> <laughs> So even, even if we're treating for ticks, mosquitoes, grubs, it's all organic. There's some really, as, as Barry has probably taught everyone, there's some amazing organic solutions available. And that's, uh, that's how we roll. And it's, it's, uh, it's not often mentioned, but in water basin people, environmentalists talk a lot about how lawns are bad for the environment. And uh, so it's worth noting that, you know, all the water flows into the rivers and the drains and the ocean ultimately, and, and it's referred to as green pavement. So <clears throat> healthy vegetation is, doesn't have to be grass, just worth punching that. And a grass is a very needy plant. And for that matter, it's a cold, typically what we're growing is a cool season plant. And we're trying to get through these hot summers. So we have extreme weather. One of the big things about plant health now is resilience, uh, focusing on resilience, trying to plan for the worst heavy rains, trying to plan for the worst of uh, drought conditions. And, and again, native orientation and native origin of, of uh, plant makes it a lot easier to grow. <clears throat> so uh, synthetics run off, or, so that makes the organics uh, more preferable. The, and grass doesn't have very good soak up and uh, we can have more food sources uh, and better carbon sinking with other plants other than grass. So our, our, we have a few missions. One is uh, less lawn mowing and more food growing. We, we try to help people reduce lawns to have healthier other kinds of so, plants. So Dan, when you're talking about food sources, you're talking about um, converting turf grass over to vegetable growing or what do you mean by that? Well, it could be both um, gardens, naturally vegetable gardens, but uh, food, the food web starts at the insects and the birds. So when I, when I think about other plants, I'm also thinking about flowers, uh, native plants, you know, perennials, middle story, uh, you know, fruit trees, things like that. It, 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 the food for the birds and insects uh, are, is uh, just as important. And yeah, grasses. Sure. I, yeah, I just wanted to be clear because when you know you, you talk about food sources, my mind immediately went to the soil food web. I just wanted to be sure we're all understanding what you mean. Okay, thank you. So in our in our organic practice, you know we're a lawn care business first, but we are uh, evolving into. Um, uh, a company that helps install native plants and does uh, landscape design and uh, garden uh, testing and maintenance and planting. <clears throat> so uh, this is just a, this is a rerun right here. When it comes to uh, um, lawn programs, whether it's a chemical company or an organic company, the, uh, the program is weed feed and seed and repeat. And so that's our, that's what we do. We have a couple of things that are different in the springtime, we're trying to be good to the uh, pollinators and we are staying out of the beds. We're leaving leaves in the beds. We don't scratch the ground much. We don't want to scare up weed seeds. So we go easy on the raking. We hold off in the beds until, uh, until it gets warmer and all the reptiles and uh, tunneling bees and, and in insects life cycles have uh, completed. <clears throat> so in the spring, we'll do some grass seed patching, maybe light overseeding. In the fall, we'll do the aeration, dethatching, and uh, heavier overseeding. But other than that, it's all the same, weed feed and seed. And then a few things in the fall, uh, some deer, re well, deer repellent can be year round. Um, one thing to mention about <clears throat> fall cleanup is blowers, whether they're electric or gas, they're kind of bad for the environment. They do strip the topsoil in many cases. So we, in the fall, we do a lot of mulch mowing of leaves and if there's excess, we use lawn sweepers. We tow them with um, zero emission mowers. And so it's very quiet, but we do a lot less blowing because not only 
the mulch mowing and leaving leaves in the beds, but also lawn sweeping. So that's healthier for, uh, that's a lot healthier for lawns. And one, one thing we noticed is it, it, certainly in our customer base where everybody is trying to uh, have the least uh, uh, impact, uh, the most ecologically minded people, uh, potassium ice melt, uh, based on my experience, seems to be better than um, calcium and magnesium alternatives. So we promote that a little bit as well, pet friendly, and, and it's, it's actually lawn food. So it, it's good for the lawn instead of killing the edges. <clears throat> so talking about the ecosystem and, uh, and, and practices, let's, uh, let's see, we've got a few areas here, soil testing. You really can't uh, do soil amending until you do the soil testing. And a great man uh, that uh, I know says, you've got to balance the water, the carbon, and the nitrogen. So uh, I, a little shout out to a, uh, a friend who's a little bit of a mentor. He's done some, a lot of studying, and he's hyper organic. He, uh, he works intensively on water management and uh, balancing the carbon and nitrogen and fine tuning custom blends. And uh, so that's uh, one of his favorite sayings is uh, you balance the carbon, uh, do the hard work, balance the water, carbon and nitrogen. For microclimate considerations, uh, a master gardener I spoke with yesterday said, don't fight it. If something's not working, move it, <laughs> you know, plant something else. So I, I thought it'd be fun to pass that on. Uh, you know, the microclimate really makes a difference, you know, the sunshine and the airflow and uh, <clears throat> drainage, moisture levels, and then cultural practices, sanitation. So these are things to focus on uh, for healthier plants. In terms of water, I've done more drainage projects recently, and uh, and I mentioned resilience. I, I actually uh, was in the uh, resilience business for a while in the IT world uh, as a continuity, business continuity planning and management uh, certified professional. How do you plan for resilience when the weather is as severe as it's been? How do you get rid of that saturation uh, without winding up being bone dry? So I think it's interesting when you're, when you're looking at problem areas, whether it's lawn or garden or beds, you know, you have to look at the house, you know, or look at patios. Where's that water coming from? Uh, is it coming from underground? Is it flowing from uphill? And then when you make a choice, you have to manage that water somehow. So you have to reduce the water. And there's a couple of approaches. One way is to drain it away somewhere else, totally drain it, you know, with non-porous pipe. But if you do that, you might wind up with something that's totally dry. So for me, it's been an awakening. I don't know how tuned into uh, water management others are, but uh, it's, it's an eye opener. When you go to a site and look it over and you look at, you know, what you might want to spray, spray kill or, or, uh, or take care of otherwise, uh, you got to think about the, the saturation level. Now, draining takes it away. Containing what I mean by that is like French drains. You know, if you move it down below and maybe do a dry well or a French drain and, and, and the water is down below, in a drought through capillary action, you can get some moisture to help you withstand the drought. So that's, uh, it's, I think it's helpful to, if you don't have a drainage uh, specialists on staff with things like this in mind, it's good to, uh, to talk to somebody about that. Uh, and then uh, rain barrels, we haven't really done a lot with rain barrels, but I think uh, with resilience in mind, that's another fantastic thing. So some of these are reminders to self, you know, the, sometimes we know best practices, but forming those good habits are difficult. And uh, <clears throat> so here's a reminder, rain barrels are fantastic because they catch the rain when you get too much of it. And then if you, uh, if you need water, you can, you know, drip line, uh, release it uh, into different areas. And then, you know, there's other approaches, rain gardens. I mentioned a friend of mine 
who was in uh, hyper organic. He studied with some other folks uh, who were really into making key lines. Uh, and key lines are very interesting. If you take a slope that's really under heavy runoff pressure and, and saturation, and you kind of make a trench around the upper border of it and, and fill that with rocks, you're, you're catching a lot of the water uh, that's otherwise going to flow down the hill, but then it's going down to the bottom and then you still get to use a little bit of it. Some of it runs around the corner. So key lines are something new to me. I thought it'd be worth noting that and uh, perhaps looking. I, I want to learn more about it myself. I've seen it done this season by uh, this other uh, provider who uh, does a, a ton of drainage work. The soil is so key. And uh, as long as it's not anaerobic and uh, suffocating uh, roots, then uh, you can probably do a lot to improve plant health by understanding the character of that soil. So in our practice, we actually did get into the habit of doing uh, tests for those who wanted them. And they're uh, very inexpensive and very simple tests. There's a free test in Connecticut available from the ag station. And the metrics there are pH, organic matter, uh, the nutritional elements, NPK, and some calcium and magnesium, not much else. Very simple. And so uh, they're done for free, but you, you have to take the time to take the test and then you have to scan it and attach it to the customer record and then uh, forward it to the customer, interpret it, make recommendations. So there's some cost involved. So we charge a modest fee. It's under $100 uh, per test. And then it's there uh, to refer to uh, as we uh, work towards more ideal conditions in the soil. Uh, we actually bought a uh, in-house soil test and I have a chemistry major who's been able to do a few special things uh, people have uh, asked us to test for lead, to test for iron. And, and so we've done a few things in-house. That soil test uh, from Gemplers was about $500. Uh, we haven't used it that much because it is a little labor intensive. It'll take us maybe an hour and a half. And in some cases, if somebody just wants the basic test uh, for these basic metrics, it's easier just to drop off a pile of them at the agricultural station. We happen to service the neighborhood where this uh, station is so it's very easy for us <clears throat> next next level up you can get a better test from uh the yukon cooperative uh, extension and every state has a you know cooperative extension universities their test is uh pretty inexpensive also it's about 15 dollars, and it's even less in volume if you do 10 or more and but they add the cec and they test for lead and and uh, they provide some other uh, ratings on other materials like manganese, boron, uh, I think uh, iron built in. So that's something I think I might <clears throat> move uh, to do this more, maybe uh, go with a uh, still a moderate price test. Uh, I wonder how many uh, land care providers are, uh, are actively doing tests. I'd say less, less than 1%, <laughs> that would be my guess. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's hard to slow down and, and talk about it, take the time. But if you look at any organic program, line one is soil test. And I, I just I run into so many people who say, oh, yeah, yeah, I put some lime down. Oh, you did. Well, did you test it? Did you test your soil? No. You, did, did you know what the pH was? <laughs> I, I actually just bought a uh, $100 pH tester. Again, same, same uh, close friend who's in the organics business. He, wore, he wears that thing around his neck. He does core samples and he's boop, 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 boop. He's doing the pH all over the place. I said, that thing's fantastic. I ordered it and then it said, you have to soak the tip in a, yeah, yeah. a uh, you know, I, I haven't gotten that done yet. It's funny, change is so difficult. Um, so you can get a better test, and I think that pr this is probably a better way to go. Instead of a $60 test that's free, why not get the CEC and, and maybe, you know, check on something as important as lead and, you know, go with $120. It's still a win for everybody. So I think I'll probably move to the second level test. Uh, Midwest Labs, I recently learned, is the largest private lab in the country. and 
they have, uh, well, we could take a quick look at their report. Got it linked here. Might be a little hard to make out. Let me see if I can expand that. Uh-huh, there we go. Maybe a little more. Okay, so front lawn, back lawn, what crop are we growing? They're, they're really a big service for uh, farmers and, and uh, agriculture, same thing. Uh, front lawn, we've got organic matter and they tell you if it's high or very high. I guess uh, organic matter, we must be shooting for the four to 8% range. Uh, recently, I heard that peat moss is like 100% organic matter and that compost is typically 25 to 35% organic matter. Interesting. Uh, so this, this gives you the ratings on, uh, on other key metrics. You know, uh, I see potassium, cadmium, sodium, uh, the pH here came up seven. Uh, the nitrogen is listed. <clears throat> and then there's recommendations here in terms of how many pounds of, of what to add. So this being for a lawn, it looks like uh, the recommendation was to uh, do nitrogen 95 pounds per acre. So that boils down to about half a pound per thousand. I don't know how many lawn care people deal in acres, uh, but uh, I usually deal in thousand, per thousand square feet. And it's interesting to see the potassium here, maybe a third of the nitrogen, and, but, and yet for the back lawn, it's suggesting uh, more potassium than nitrogen. So that's just a little look at a, at a standard report from a higher level, higher, uh, higher cost test. And exit that. And then they, they have a water soluble one uh, someone was telling me that this water soluble test can almost replace the the uh, the bioassay test. Uh, and again, I'm 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 just you know I, I I'm just learning about this stuff. But, but this water soluble report, what's it mean? You know, it's measuring uh, potassium and and uh, <clears throat> phosphorus and calcium and magnesium and. Uh, so that's that's something uh, worth looking into. I, I, yeah, John John's making a good point. Uh, I agree with him. I've never heard of um, any accurate tests for nitrogen in the soil. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, from I've been uh, looking at soil reports from the ag station for a long time. They come up high. They come up low. Um, <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's interesting. Something else to uh, clarify. Yeah, <laughs> learn something every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's another recommendation sheet just to see what, uh, it's a little different uh, approach. <clears throat> uh, here we go. And here's potassium and calcium, uh, again, pounds per uh, acre. You have to convert it, but uh, sulfur, manganese, boron. So this is, this is a higher level test. Uh, I have not uh, done amendments to fix uh, imbalances in manganese and boron before. So it, uh, if you really want to fine tune some soil for a healthier plant, the higher level tests uh, look like they can uh, make a difference because there's, it's, it's, uh, there's more to it than just the NPK. However, it's statistically speaking, we seem to do pretty well with our lawns, focusing on the simple metrics that we've focused on so far and the, and the, input, the inputs that we use. Bioassay, I wanna learn more about. Uh, I understand maybe somebody during Q and A can talk about that. Maybe there's somebody here who's used it, but I, I think it, uh, I think that, Barry, you may know what the bioassay is. Is that analyzing the microbes and looking at how many good ones versus bad ones there are? Well, yeah, uh, the Soil Food Web Lab does that um, along with a couple of other companies. Um, um, we, one of our speakers, uh, Mike Colon, uh, with Lincoln Landscape, he, he does, yeah, you say, he does all his school grounds and stuff. So um, 
it, it really helps him a lot to get that information when he's dealing with those kind of situations. It's kind of, you know, it's expensive. So for a homeowner lawn, it, it's may not always be practical. Got it. Yeah, I remember Mike. He was he was teaching at uh, one of the uh, NOFA classes yep. I took, mm -hmm. and I remember him talking about uh, his big big success with molasses on yep. uh, on playing fields. <laughs> Eat the, the bacteria, and they give the nitrogen to the turf. <laughs> yeah, amen. <laughs> that's that's one of the harder things to get across to people um, is the uh, you know how synthetics and, and, and uh, chemicals retard the normal uh, life cycle. And you just, you kind of codified it there, you know, where you feed the bacteria and that delivers the nutrients to the plants. It's, it's a totally different thing as opposed to a water soluble hit like intravenous right to lazy roots who aren't, who aren't creating exudates. You know, it's yeah. funny. So I don't quite get the, cation exchange but there are you know it's another metric where you can tell if you're in, in range or not and you can do something about it this this talks about how we can bond you know it's the ability uh, through negative charges i think to bond uh, uh new particles uh, related to nutrition to soil particles and it, it also is an indication of a soil's ability to uh that retain the pollutant uh, particles. This is uh, our Wikipedia uh, explanation of the CEC, cation exchange. And I, I, I put this in here because it's always, it's always mentioned in the training and yet it kind of, uh, I didn't really focus much on it and it's not part of the basic test that we work on. Yeah, I, I kind of I agree with you. I, I just don't. I'm, I'm not a um, chemist, so I don't understand cation exchange. But I certainly can uh, understand you know, the biological, the microbes, and everything in there. They're eating and pooping, and it's all being recycled. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, learning more about this and. If you get a CEC rating and you get some recommendations, then I think the light bulbs will go on. You say, oh, I see what we need to do here to, to improve our cation exchange. And in many cases, the having a terrible cation exchange may explain you know, a problem lawn where all the other metrics came up looking good. And, and you still, you know, if it's not saturation and all your other metrics are good, maybe it's the CEC. So in terms of do, doing soil testing and, and having it be part of a practice, uh, this is why we started so basic because we wanted to succeed and we have. We probably have 60 or 70% uh, of all our customers with uh, soil tests that are attached to their records and we act on it. So in, in the, uh, for the metric organic matter, I've heard so many things about organic matter, how it's it's a key to adsorption to prevent leaching. It's, it's key to proper microbial activity. Um, so the higher, the better. And, you know, using a granular organic fertilizer will raise the organic matter level, mulch mowing grass, mulch mowing leaves, that'll raise the organic level. So when we, when we interpret these uh, tests for people, we'll, we'll uh, mention that the things we're doing will uh, slowly increase their mediocre organic matter level ratings, but they may want to do some top dressing with compost because compost is loaded with organic matter. Uh, hopefully it's good compost. And pH uh, is a logarithmic scale. So the difference between six and seven is profound. They say the tolerable range is between five, eight and seven, three. But uh, I think the target is between six six and seven. So if you come, if if your pH is below six six, then I suggest uh, moving the needle. What we've observed is that if we're using uh, high calcium humic acid enhanced lime, I think the uh, 
the original name brand was Salucal, but there's a number of them out there now, Nutrite and others. Uh, if you do 12 pounds per thousand, you get about a half a pH point, you know, after the three to five months. And so it's very easy for us to manage pH. Uh, <clears throat> NPK, it, you have to figure out about that nitrogen test. Uh, but the N NPK, regardless of what the test tells people, uh, in an organic program, you want about two pounds of nitrogen. And you can get a half a pound of that per thousand square feet, two pounds per thousand square feet. So you can get a half a pound per thousand just by leaving your grass clippings. <clears throat> and then how do you get another pound and a half? Well, one, one way would be to use that uh, Branch Creek uh, or other um, corn gluten meal, 1002 lawn food. Uh, if you, if you do 10% and it's five pounds per thousand, you do the math, that's a half a pound per application. So if you use that. Yeah, I like that product a lot. Not, not just for the, uh, the nitrogen, but also the fact that it, you can seed and it, it, will, it, won't, it will prevent germination of cr crabgrass, but not turf seed. That's, that's a huge plus. That's amazing. And you can drive yourself crazy trying to confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, my clients confirm it <laughs> yeah well i mean just like googling because there's so much oh, oh, yeah. there's so much information out there that says oh corn gluten no grass seeding but okay. what i what i finally got out of it was that the grass seeds don't have hairs on them and uh and the right. the, the, the corn, cgm just burns those hairs and, and the, right. the mm -hmm. crabgrass seeds have the hairs and they get shunted so that's pretty cool exactly yeah yeah, we, every now and then we may need to trump up the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the phosphorus, but applying 1002 is spread out a couple times in the spring and once in the fall. It's not a bad regime. It's pretty simple, too. And uh, calcium and magnesium, we, we just kind of keep our eye on that. And if we need to add lime, we just hope that the calcium is lower than the magnesium. That way you get a two for one value proposition. You improve your calcium while you improve your pH. <clears throat> now here is a, an example of the report itself from the uh, ag station. And it's uh, basically the metrics I mentioned here, we have organic matter medium. So we get this report it also comes with a handy uh, explanation from the lab, but there's a couple things that we need to point out to the customer. And that is that uh, the lab here in the recommendations, they're talking about fertilizers with numbers like 30 on nitrogen. So they're, and, and, uh, and lime, when they talk about lime, they're talking about 25 to 50 pounds per thousand. That's totally different than uh, organic fertilizers and, and a high calcium lime. <clears throat> so we have to kind of explain that the numbers are a little different because they're living uh, a little bit in the uh, synthetic world. And these are, these are synthetic numbers. So you need higher numbers because uh, they disappear faster. <laughs> uh, here, uh, and, and probably other reasons. But if we look at this, the pH is a little bit low. You know, it's it's only a quarter point off the target. So we might suggest six pounds per thousand instead of twelve. And the bag says, you know, you 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 can take fifty pounds and uh, increase your pH by putting that on four thousand feet. So it's about ten pounds per thousand to move the needle, almost half a point. And then here we are. Nitrogen's coming in low. I don't know how they test that. And uh, phosphorus, uh, medium, high, medium. Whenever phosphorus is high, we warn people, hey, wanna, please uh, avoid <clears throat> please avoid any, uh, any fertilizing with phosphorus in it because it's regulated. Uh, it really creates uh, eutrophication in water. We don't want the phosphorus getting into the water. Uh, and so that's why it's, uh, it's regulated. And here we have potassium ranked high. So there's not a lot of, so there may be some compost top dressing uh, as suggestion, a little bit of lime. 
and the regular uh, lawn program is going to give the nit nitrogen nutrition that the lawn needs throughout the season anyway. So there's, it's not really an action item, the fact that it's showing up low. <clears throat> and so that's just a look at the report. And they talk, it's just very simple, you know, do a little in the spring. Oh, do a little in the fall and a little, little bit in the spring. This, uh, this ex the explanation of the results is useful and informative. And it does uh, mention a little bit about soil texture. Uh, the one thing I didn't mention here, uh, soil texture, sandy loam, it points out that if you have sandy loam, that's going to influence how fast uh, things run through that soil and, and what the uh, leaching uh, potential is. And it, it does influence the amount of water and nutrients that the soil can hold. So it does affect uh, your care program a little bit, uh, indicating that you might need more frequent watering uh, and you might lose nutrients uh, more readily uh, by leaching. <clears throat> And somebody just made a comment that mulch mowing all season that adds nitrogen through the, the clippings. And, and another response was, and that lowers the dumping fees. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll bring up also, um, when you talk about mulch mowing leaves, um, University of Michigan did a study years ago, um, specifically with maple leaves being mulch mowed. And, and they found that it actually reduced the amount of weed growth. Wow. Well, that's that's kind of the foundation of IPM, right? A healthier, healthier soil, healthier plants, uh, less weed pressure. Yeah, that's, and that's... on my own property, I've seen that too. We, uh, you know, I used to blow all the leaves off and have the township pick it up and everything, and uh, my soil organic matter was at three percent, and with two years of mulch mowing. And the organic uh, material I add also, it, it went up from 3% up to almost 10%. Wow. Yeah. O over the course of two years, you said? Uh, probably three years. Three years. That's fantastic. Yeah. And that's the, tar that's the target, isn't it? Like 8 to 10% organic yeah. matter? Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Now, we have a uh, customizable CRM so that we can track anything we want to uh, for our customers. And uh, I'll talk about uh, expanding the business into landscape design and, and planting natives as well as clearing invasives. I envision a day in, in our CRM where we have all the plants listed with photos attached and we can produce quotes that show the photos and that have the sizes of the plants and the prices all built in because it's a lot of work otherwise you know it's like reminds me of the it projects i used to be you got you know 72 <laughs> parts <laughs> and uh, god forbid you have to change it you know before you close the, the deal it's pretty arduous uh, but this is a screenshot of our crm system i think it's one of the best values in the world it's called v tiger it's uh it's like a uh it's like a, a more uh, affordable uh, uh, salesforce.com. And what we did is we, very simple move, we added a field for pH. So we can track the pH in the front yard, backyard, side yard. And when we get the test and we know what that pH is and we put it in there and, and, and until we add lime, it's sitting there waiting uh, to get checked and and uh, and and stimulate the delivery of the lime. Once we add the lime, we know how much it's bound to change based on what we apply. So, if I go out and I add twelve pounds per thousand at this customer, then I'll just change it to six four. And so every account ought to say six six or six eight. And if it doesn't, then we try to schedule. Uh, remediation because that's one of the most important metrics it affects uh, it affects the nutrient uptake in many cases um, so yeah so we could track anything we want grass length people prefer what their fall cleanup uh, references are and 
again, preaching to the choir, it's just, it's so important. Now here again, like soil samples, I think we've all heard and we all know that sharp blades, clean decks and disinfected decks are gonna be better for our customers. But how many of us clean the decks between lawns? How many of us spray alcohol on the bottom of the deck between lawns? Note to self, we've, we've got to do more of this because as things get more severe and there's more pathogens out there, uh, doing that is just really doing, uh, delivering a better value to the customer and it's less risk. It's, it's safer. We, you get healthier plants if you don't introduce any pathogens. And of course, they say <clears throat> the duller the blades, the more pathogens you're going to get into your grass plants. And likewise, with pruning equipment, uh, how many people spray alcohol between cuts or between plants? But, you know, it's with boxwood blight, you prune a blighted boxwood and you go and prune the next one and, and you've got boxwood blight in the next one. And it's so simple. Little spray bottle, 70% rubbing alcohol, spray it down. Uh, so, and there's other tenets worth noting in, in case somebody here hasn't heard them, but cutting, cutting it long, uh, less weed encroachment studies show, uh, you know, a quarter inch change in length affects uh, weed, statistical weed encroachment by 2%. So you can go from 11 to 25%. The shorter you cut it, the more weed encroachment you're going to get. And uh, you want to avoid clumping because the clumping is going to kill the grass. Uh, you want to keep the clippings. I'm sorry about the dump fees, but, uh, and, you know, no scalping and, you know, no, it's not good to mow when it's wet. And uh, people talk about, oh boy, people talk about, Hey, come here, come here. People talk about changing patterns and they like their lines and their stripes. But uh, I started out in business doing real mowing. And when you're pushing a real mower, you never want to stop. You want to use your momentum. So I like mowing in circles because it's more efficient. Uh, some people don't like that, but I think it looks cool because you get these flows, the contours of the property. And if you start in the middle and work your way out, then you can scare the critters off and there's less uh, death involved in the mowing process, perhaps. Uh, now, when it comes to healthy grass, you don't want invasive, uh, pervasive weeds like Indian mock strawberry and creeping Charlie, also known as ground ivy. And so we try to, and they're wicked hard to get rid of. Even with chemicals, the instructions are hand weed, treat, wait three weeks, do it again. Because it, it's really, these lawn weeds are really hard to get rid of. If you see a little patch of this stuff, you're better off stopping and weeding it. Because otherwise it's gonna outcompete the uh, grass and it's gonna be really, really costly to get rid of <clears throat> and uh and the only thing and the organics don't work very well with it <clears throat> so these two plants got to snuff them out early i've had a couple patches of it where uh i've just put cardboard over it and uh and some compost or or compost with topsoil and reseeded and uh, it worked out pretty well Uh, watering practices, NOFA talks about this, and yet I'm surprised how many customers I meet who, uh, who aren't aware of it. But uh, one long drink to elongate the roots is the best thing for uh, grass. And it's one inch or four to six inches into the soil or about 20 minutes. And that's just once a week. And you don't change anything except you double the amount if the temperature is up above 85 degrees. That's that's the advice in the Cornell uh, pesticide supervisor manuals and with NOFA worth uh, punching that in case anyone's not aware of it. Uh, really, it's an education thing. People uh, people who who water their lawns for short periods of time every other day or every day are uh, actually weakening the root systems and uh, encouraging uh, things like fungal growth and such. <clears throat> 
it, we uh, we've noticed that uh, in the in the springtime, it's not a good idea to do core aerating and heavy raking. And uh, and I mentioned it already before. We we stay off the beds until mid mid May, unless the customer demands it, then we do it. But we just try to espouse uh, the practices, best practices uh, that the pollinator pathways are uh, asking uh, private property owners to engage in. <clears throat> And usually it's in May, mid-May, when the temperatures are high enough where there's a lot of life cycles complete. And you can use, so the pollinator pathways are saying, use your leaves, whole leaves as mulch. That's where the life is. That's where the life continues. And, um, you know, sometimes mulch mowing leaves uh, makes sense. It looks a little better kept on those beds so you can, uh, but Doug Tallamy says it, it's uh, any time of year that you remove leaves from beds and mulch, mow them, shred them, you are damaging uh, some life. But uh, from, from an ideal perspective, if you can use leaves as mulch and you want the look of mulch, the framing that it provides, you can use less mulch. You can just color it up with the mulch. So mulch mowing the leaves reduces the bulk, feeds the soil, and uh, you can supply the beds with those leaves, keep some whole ones in the beds. And again, I mentioned the sweepers. Once you've done mulch mowing leaves on lawns, if there's excess, you can sweep them up super fast. Uh, I, I noticed our revenues went down for fall cleanup once we started mulch mowing and lawn sweeping. But we charge a fee for the sweeper, you know, for carting it and maintaining it and acquiring it. And that helps offset the re reduced um, revenues and the, the, the time saved. But you can do more cleanups. So I think it's important, you know, if you're if you're trying to hang on to something like a uh, like a grass dumping fee as part of your business, your business may not do as well in the long run as if you think the way they talk about in business school, build value for the customer. Amazon got where they are today by cutting their prices as often as they could uh, on certain things and, and just building value. If the more value you build, the more in demand you'll be and you'll always be busy. My own uh, soapbox there. Now this, this eye chart is an organic program where it shows the kinds of things that are being done and the timing of them. I don't, I don't use this. Hey, come here, come here. Come here. Jesus. Okay. <laughs> I don't really use this anymore. I think it's like teaching uh, people how to program computers. Once they realize how knowledge intensive it is, they're happy to leave it up to the professionals. So this is uh, the next uh, screen. This is more like it, you know, you do a little, a little fertilizing in the spring and uh, you know, maybe a little something in the summer and you might need to treat for grubs in the, in the fall and fertilize a little more so keep it simple but this is this is our our program and so for for the organic uh, treatments we like the the product we talked about already the corn gluten meal uh, we we use some uh, probiotic spray uh, we do some compost top dressing we do use product the fiesta product which i guess you're pretty familiar with and you uh you you sell right barry yeah okay and we, we do a mix of grass seed a lot of people recommending mixing uh three kinds of grass seed for resilience tall fescue is the lowest maintenance and uh, and it's the most durable so a grass seed mix with the majority tall fescue uh, will i think provide a healthier lawn and under shade trees it's funny, you mentioned uh, mulch mowing maple leaves. Um, I was reading about shade, uh, trying to grow grass in uh, uh, under trees where it's shady. And 
there was a lot of talk about competition for for nutrients <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and water and so they you know they talked about uh, not not trying to grow uh, grass uh, where uh, where you have trees that are uh, very uh, surface level with surface level root systems but what's worse i think is uh, blowers often uh, reduce the amount of covering on on top of root systems and uh, i remember being in nofa class and the suggestion was made that it's okay to put a little bit of compost down maybe to build back up uh, some of the uh, protective covering over root systems. Not a lot, but uh, anyway, there's some, there's some, uh, also mentioned is, it's, it's interesting. A lot of people say leave leaves under the trees uh, out to the drip line and it's great mulch and the trees love it. And it's good for the trees. Well, that's okay, unless you want grass under there. Uh, but if you do that and you want grass under there, you're dead because it's going to kill the grass. It's also going to uh, change the pH. It's going to reduce the pH quite a bit. So <clears throat> there's right. actually... Uh, Ed, uh, yeah, Ed has a question here. I'm not so sure if you can answer it. It's, how is the new growth of seedlings south of New York City per soil temp? And Ed, I'm not sure I understand your question. <laughs> Well, we can uh, we can talk that. about soil yeah, temps. Ahead. Yeah, are you aware of the the soil temp websites where you can just go go in and oh, check yeah. it by? Yeah, that's that's really cool. I was happy to learn about that. So, things to consider for uh, for good plant health regarding uh, uh, practices and and the microclimates, sun and shade. You know, we live in we live in a time now where we can I, we can pretty much identify any plant using the supercomputer we wear on our hip. So there's uh, as, as long as the customer is willing to pay us for our time, we can uh, figure out what kind of plant we're dealing with, what the requirements are from sun and shade, and we can kind of customize. Uh, we can even measure the amount of sun using the the supercomputer cell phone that we carry. Uh, so, you know, we, we need to be aware of moisture and, and the requirements of the plants we're working with and the moisture in that area. And airflow is super important. I, um, I know I've forgotten about that at times, and it's, an, it's a good reminder. You need to have airspace around a plant and you need to have airspace through a plant. So I was talking to a, a master gardener a couple days ago. Uh, and she mentioned that when you're dealing with plant, you know, sick plants, one of the best things you can do is prune off the, the bad stuff and, and make some air holes. You know, once that airflow is better, you, you're going to get a healthier plant. And interestingly enough, where you may have plant pathogens or insect uh, problems, you no longer want to leave the leaves because the uh, insect life is in the often in the leaves or the pathogen like a uh, anthracnose virus uh, a fungus that is <clears throat> can uh, persist in the infected leaves on the ground or on the plant so you know it should be it should be buried uh, in a deep pile or super composted or even uh, they incinerate trash, they make energy out of the trash in my area. So sending it to, uh, uh, to the dumpster is, is not as bad. I'd hate to have to landfill something like that. But anyway, there are times when you don't wanna lead the leaves. If you've got pathogens, you've got to uh, destroy and remove the, the um, leaf litter. You gotta keep, you gotta be aware of the weeds. Uh, Weeds are going to affect uh, the plants. It's helpful to be able to diagnose plants. Any uh, any state has these home and garden education centers and plant diag labs, so anyone can take a sample of a of an afflicted plant and uh, quite often get help uh, 
at no charge or low charge. So uh, just by being observant and doing some monitoring and scouting, uh, practice can be expanded and uh, healthier plants can be pursued by using the state uh, level resources that are available or others or, or private. You wanna check for winter injury and uh, sometimes uh, sick plants are a result of misuse of pesticides or other chemicals. So there's quite a bit involved oh, in- all, all really good stuff. Um, we're just about at the one hour point. So uh, I know you got tons of more information, but let's see if we can wrap it up within a couple minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is all uh, stuff that I talked about. Mulching, you know, don't don't put it up against the trunks. Don't pile it too deep, three inches. Equipment makes a big difference. Electric equipment makes for happier plants because it's quiet and non-polluting where you are. And uh, the whole thing about natives, natives are more resilient and uh, and they're easier to grow and maintain and people want them. So uh, I've got resources here, which are really useful. Uh, it's a, here's a calendar that tells you how to, how to eliminate invasives and when. Well, this is actually a, a review of like the top 12. And what's amazing about this long list of invasives, I look around the house I'm in here and I see like six of them outside. Uh, Tree of Heaven, Garlic Mustard, Norway Maple, it's crazy. So this is a, this is a great resource. Uh, and then the re here's the removal calendar, which is which is great. Uh, you know what's you have to know whether it's a pest or a, or an invasive plant. When's the best time to um, to take care of it, and how do you take care of it? So this chart shows here we are in March and April. So w what are we working on now? Multifloral rows. Uh, talking about mowing it <laughs> and. Uh, so that's just a good example, Japanese Barbary. These are great resources that uh, you, can, you can find online and it's just good to keep links handy. And, and there are a, a lot of other resources like wildflower lists and, and trees. And we, we are offering to do landscape design surveys of, uh, for invasives design and plant. <clears throat> And uh, if you're going to do a design and installation of plants, I guess uh, it stands to reason you've got to have a landscape designer with native plant knowledge. And it can be as simple as a sketch. Uh, this is a project we did, and the, the designer was, um, he just did a hand sketch. And these little codes have uh, associated values to different plants and different plant groups. And uh, so you generate a plant list and here's the codes, here's the plant list, the Latin name. And so it, uh, it becomes, like I said, a little bit of a project where um, you've got to, you got to put, you manage the sizes and the prices. And it's been interesting to see people's uh, practices in terms of what they charge. Uh, if the plants, are 11,000, what do you charge for delivery installation and, and all the time you have to spend with that customer? Uh, some people do twice the value of the plants as the install fees. So that, uh, that pretty much wraps it up. Of course, if you're doing design and install, you know, the, there's the prep, you know, probably some compost and mulch, planting and maintenance and, uh, just worth noting that the reason we, uh, we have led as a, a zero emission company, the reason we got into it is when I learned that lawn care gear is up to 20 times more polluting per gallon than a car, and that it's, it's probably 10% of our air pollution today. So that's why we uh, do everything electrically. And, and it, it gives us a green halo. People come to us for their organic treatments and their native plants because they know that at the at the very foundation, we are across the board, one of the greenest, uh, most sustainable companies in the world. And we're, and we're able to avoid a thousand metric tons of air pollution uh, each year. And that number goes up each year. So that's, that's a lot of air pollution 
<clears throat> we've done uh, about 8,000 acres without, without gasoline. We've avoided emissions of 8 million miles in a car. And thank you, Barry. Thank you for inviting me. Dan, thank you. Thank you so much for reaching out to me. <laughs> um, I just don't know how come we haven't met before. <laughs> but but you, you, you have laid out such a, a great plan for so many different things. Um, I'm going to ask you to come back at another time to do part two. Oh, wonderful. I'd love to. Thanks. That'd be great. So again, thank you very much. Um, so this will, is being recorded. Um, it will be up on our website shortly. People can watch it at their leisure. Um, next week, I'm going to be out of town, so we won't be having um, another webinar. But the week after that, May 18th, um, we have <laughs> we, we have a, a couple people from herbicide free campuses. Uh, these, these are students as a student organization that has been working to um, reduce, if not eliminate, uh, pesticides on, on campus grounds. And they, they just completed a, um, a report on the state of um, e ecological landscape management on campuses. So they're going to uh, do a short, pres an hour long presentation on that. So I'm looking forward to hearing from them. And again, Dan, thank you so much. We really appreciate the information and we'll be in touch. All right. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Good night.